Hi there, welcome to another episode of Science and Technology Q&A for Kids and Others. So I'm happy to try and answer all kinds of questions people might ask about science, how things work, technology, how things work uh, at all levels, but particularly ones that uh, are kind of things people have wondered about and uh, just uh, curious about how things might work. All right, let's see. We have a few left over here from previous times. There's one from Ruki. What technological and or scientific capabilities must humans achieve to be able to manipulate and reprogram matter at will? Okay, it's an interesting question. So let's see. Matter is you know, made of atoms. They're bound together. They make solids, things like that. Well, let me say, first of all, matter tends to come in solids, liquids, and gases. Those are the three standard phases of matter. It doesn't cover typical biological systems, which are usually gels that are sort of a little bit solid, a little bit liquid, and so on. It doesn't cover things like fire, that's a plasma, but your average material comes as either solid, liquid, or gas. That's like water is, is uh, you know, ice, many different kinds of ice, liquid water, just one kind of liquid water, or so it seems, and steam, just one kind of steam. And um, the, when you talk about reprogramming matter, the typical thing you might be thinking about is solids, because solids are things that sort of stay the way they are. Liquids flow and change their configuration. Gases, they're always uh, uh, moving around all the time. So we're really talking about solid objects. And so then the question is, if you're going to uh, sort of re, you're going to define how a solid is configured, well, you have to make sure that the atoms that you put in the places where you put them are going to stay where you put them. It's no good to have something where you built this giant sort of city of, of molecules or, or atoms placed in different places and it just all collapses. That doesn't work. But there are processes like, for example, atomic force microscopes can pick up single atoms and just place them on a solid surface. And you could do that to some extent with some kinds of atoms to a certain degree. If you try and sort of build it up too much, it will, it will start collapsing and it will just sort of fall, the collapse of its own. Atoms will get attracted to each other, repelled from each other, and they'll just sort of rearrange themselves. There's a, there's a kind of a well-known uh, law of force law between atoms, uh, often um, um, uh, the Leonard Jones potential is the most common thing people use. And it says, if you take two atoms, two atoms that don't have electric charges, and you kind of move them, well, if you move them really close to each other, they'll repel. If they're a bit further apart, they'll attract. So people often think about the inverse square law, which is what governs, um, for example, electrical interactions. That means that if two things are a distance R apart, the, um, uh, the, the, the force between them is, is goes like one over R squared. Um, in the case of just neutral atoms, the Leonard Jones potential is like one of R to the sixth is the, is the force of attraction. So it, it kind of dies off very quickly as you, as you move the atoms apart. And one of R to the twelfth is the force of repulsion when the things get really close together. So that's kind of the thing that you're, you're dealing with whenever you're kind of arranging atoms is they'll have some force law that governs how they'll be, how they'll be connected to each other and so on. So you can, you can, but you can, to some extent, you can just sort of pick them up with some kind of um, uh, pick up individual atoms and arrange them where you want. And, and people have done kind of cute things where they write logos with individual atoms and so on. So that's, a, that's kind of a thing you can do to kind of shape something. Now, if you say reprogram matter, well, most matter doesn't do stuff. Most matter, like solid objects, just sit there being solid objects and don't change their configuration. The kinds of things that uh, it is, it is the rare kind of matter that can kind of change its configuration. And in fact, even in, in biological systems where we have examples of molecules that really do things, so to speak, you know, we have molecules where, I don't know, you can have um, one molecule that kind of walks along the, the strand of another molecule. We could have a molecule that um, uh, has some particular um, that when it's when there's some electrical effect, the, like our actin molecules in our muscles, when there's an electrical, uh, uh, it, um, when there's a, a, a voltage there, the, the molecule will contract. Um, will so there are things like that where a molecule will like do stuff. Now I suppose you could ask the question: Could you make a molecule 
that will just kind of where you could program it to do whatever you want. How would you give it input? Maybe you give it an electrical voltage. Maybe you shine light on it. Um, maybe, maybe other molecules come and interact with it. By the time you're dealing with other molecules interacting with it, you're dealing more with chemical reactions. You're dealing less with configuring matter like a solid object. You're more dealing with something like a liquid where you know, chemical reactions can happen much more readily in a liquid because molecules are always, uh, always running into each other. That's sort of the, the best case for chemical reactions is a liquid because the molecules are still all moving around and the different things that might react with each other will eventually find each other in the liquid yet there are lots of molecules there. So it's not like a gas where it's quite dilute and the molecules might just never find each other. And it's not like a solid where the molecules are just locked in place and will never interact with each other. That's kind of why, you know, in, the, in, uh, um, in, in airports, it's like you can't take too many liquids on planes because that's where you could make chemical reactions and make, uh, you know, explosives and who knows what else. Um, whereas that's that's not something with with a solid you don't get to have chemical reactions happen because the molecules are locked in place in um, uh, in a um, uh, in the kind of uh, crystal structure or whatever else it is in in the solid. So it's usually either a crystal where the molecules are arranged in a very regular array or something like an amorphous solid like a glass where the molecules are just like, it's just like throwing balls into a ball pit. They're just, all the sort of atoms are just sort of uh, arranged randomly like that. But in any case, there's, there's sort of a different question of whether you can set up molecules so that a molecule itself or a piece of material, as soon as something happens to it, as soon as some atom ar arrives at one end, suddenly you've got this, uh, you know, giant with this microscopic kind of cog-based thing where sort of an atom will move and another atom will move and eventually you'll get um, something that behaves like, let's say, a mechanical com computer. Can you make things like that out of atoms? Well, people were very interested in that about, um, oh, we're now 30, 30 to 40 years ago. Um, and uh, the whole sort of early idea of molecular machines and nano uh, early versions of nanotechnology and so on, there was a big effort to try and think about how would you actually make kind of machine-like things, but down at the molecular scale. And, and it seems to be perfectly plausibly possible. The problem is it's, it's, it's hard to get that sort of manufacturing device to, to start. Uh, I mentioned that you can move individual atoms into place, but it's a really slow process. And if you wanted to build a thing of non-trivial size, it would take ridiculously long doing that. It probably wouldn't even be successful. It would, it would kind of deform as a result of those atomic forces and so on. But so, the, the, the thing that people have always hoped for is that you will be able to make a molecular assembler that where you've successfully done this process of sort of going and, and making a, um, a thing that can move, mole move, move the atoms around an atomic, uh, an atomic scale, and you do it just once and you make an atomic uh, molecular assembler, and then the molecular assembler can make a production line and making other molecular assemblers, and pretty soon you have molecular assemblers all over the place. And then you can start saying, you know, have this little tiny arm that's made of a few atoms and so on, move this around and, and do this and that and the other. Um, one of the things that happened when that was being discussed like 35 or so years ago was uh, people got very worried. Well, if you could start making molecular assemblers like that, maybe you would start being able to just turn all the matter in the world into, I think it was usually called gray goo, where sort of the molecular assembler would be very successfully taking atoms from everything and just turning them into some boring goo type thing. Now, in a sense, biological life is doing something a little bit like that. You know, when, when you have a, um, uh, you know, it's taking materials, nutrients, whatever, from the soil, the atmosphere, whatever else, and it's turning those things into the goo of, I don't know, some, some uh, uh, piece of algae or, so, or, or some fungus or something like this. And uh, that hasn't, you know, hasn't ended the world to do that. The concern was if you make molecular assembly really work and it becomes really efficient, you can kind of just like start taking over the world and the whole thing turns into this gray goo and sort of everything in the world uh, just turns to that and, and that's really bad. And I think that's, that's one of the several reasons why kind of the, the nanotechnology, this molecular assembly thing, sort of people, well, there were, there were a number of different reasons that had to do with sort of details of, of uh, oh, I don't know, people in chemistry and material science saying, oh, there's this new thing, we don't really like that, and just a whole lot of, of, of weird kind of scientific politics and so on. But 
it doesn't sort of change the the question of what uh, well uh, you know th this whole question about programmable matter um, the uh, gosh um, many different ways to take this and maybe I shouldn't spend too much too much more time on it but but um, uh, a bunch of things I've worked on with cellular automata for example these very simple uh, very simple rules where you just have a collection of cells and each cell is updated depending on the, the colors of its neighbors. You could imagine implementing a cellular automaton in, at an, an atomic scale. If you could do that, and if you could specify the initial values of this collection of cells, then it's rather easy to make cellular automata that can act like arbitrary computers. And that means that you can readily sort of do a computation at the molecular scale. I kind of suspect there may be easier ways to do computations at the molecular scale that don't even just work in, uh, that don't require kind of solid phase type stuff, but that's a, that's a somewhat different story. Um, I think that there's also an interesting direction, um, not so much as kind of solid phase make an arbitrary piece of matter, um, is uh, the level of things like drugs, where most drug molecules work by there's some molecule that is important in, in our biology and it has a certain shape. And a drug molecule comes in and it has a certain shape too, and its shape kind of locks into some active site on the molecule that it's trying to affect that is part of us, so to speak. And so the molecule will come in and it will be a, a blocking of the function of the molecule that's in us or an enhancing of the function of the molecule that's in us and so on. But most drug molecules work by this sort of physical structure of just, can you fit into this pocket in this other molecule and so on. So one of the things that I've long thought would be the case is that eventually one can imagine molecules that are sort of algorithmic drug molecules, where in addition to just saying, do I fit into this little pocket here, the thing has essentially sensors on the molecule that are part of the molecule that can be sensitive to other features of the environment and say, well, I'm only going to block this molecule if the following six other things are true. And that's a way to get much more specific in being able to attack or, or help some, some particular piece of, of biological tissue. But um, there, there's, 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 yeah, there's, there's more to say this, I, I think, about this, I think. But I think that the idea of, for example, let me just make a thing. Okay, so, so here's a question. Can you have a 3D printer that prints at a molecular scale? It's, a, it's an interesting question. 3D printers that print at a macroscopic scale that have you know, plastic or metal or sugar or whatever they're printing with, uh, one of the things that's notable about 3D printers is they're not quite as easy to set up as you might have thought. Because when you print, it matters that you can't, for example, end up printing something that's just in midair and has no supports. There's a certain uh, sort of design for printability that's necessary. And every printer has different constraints about you know, where its print head can go and, and what can hold up what and, and how does heat get dissipated as the print head uh, extrudes another piece of plastic, all those kinds of things. So I think one can expect that when one is doing uh, kind of molecular scale things, there will be at least all those constraints and perhaps many more. And, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, but I think the, the, the hope would be that eventually one can make a molecular assembler that can make other molecular assemblers. That's, that's kind of the, the desire. And then you'd be able to sort of make any structure of a molecule in terms of, okay, for example, one question is, could you make a mechanical computer at molecular scale? This was something people talked about like 40 years ago or something. And, and the answer is, it's not physically impossible. It's just hard to make it. And, you know, even if you look at bacteria, for example, they have flagella that are, that are kind of um, uh, sort of um, uh, sort of tails that are attached to, the, um, to the, the bacterium. And if you look with an electron microscope or something, you'll see that they actually have little gear teeth, they're little cogs, and they move around. They're kind of like motors that move step by step by step. And they look very much like kind of little machines. And so that's a place where that's just made of protein molecules. Um, that's a place where one's able to make something that kind of looks like a piece of a mechanical computer. Um, and that's, uh, you know, an, another approach that people have tried to take is to use DNA, um, which is a molecule where, where one can sort of specify the sequence uh, 
um, on the molecule and, and it curls up differently depending on what that sequence is and so on, to use DNA as the kind of raw material to make, uh, to make arbitrary things out of. So not DNA as a way that happens in us, where it's a, a thing for programming cells, where you make from DNA, you, you know, through RNA and so on, you make proteins, um, but rather to use DNA as an actual kind of building block itself, where, for example, you might make a tile where there's an edge to the tile that's a sequence, that's a DNA sequence, and it can only be attached to another tile that has the appropriate uh, complementary DNA sequence and so on. And so you can start kind of building up um, the uh, uh, building up a structure just by using DNA itself. And DNA is a fairly stable molecule, unlike RNA. Um, and so that, that's, a, that's a possible thing to do. I've always thought that it's a little bit of a, um, an unfortunate kind of admission of, of technology defeat to say, we don't know how to make something which out of molecules ourselves, let's just uh, leverage uh, kind of what biology has done. It's kind of like, um, we don't know how to make a bicycle, instead we're going to ride a horse because horses already exist and they've been made by biology. And I kind of think it would be nice if one could do it sort of from first principles without having the whole, uh, you know, whole giant bag of, of chemistry associated with specifically with DNA. All right, let's see. Um, okay, the question's here about, can I explain CRISPR um, from Aaron and Slayer? So basic issue is if, uh, CRISPR is a, is a technique for gene editing. It's a technique for changing DNA, changing DNA by just saying, I want to change the DNA. So, you know, we humans have DNA strands that have about 6 billion base pairs in them. Uh, what that means is there's a little block of atoms that is a base, sometimes called a residue, in, um, uh, that is some particular block of atoms. And there are four different kinds of blocks of atoms a, C, T, G, um, and you can ask me what those stand for. And I'm always, uh, uh, I always forget guanine and I don't know, A, C, G, T. And um, the, the way, uh, and, and there's, a, uh, there's a backbone to DNA, which forms this kind of double helix structure. And then there are these uh, bases that go on that backbone. And so everything about us that is specified genetically is programmed in our DNA in that sequence of ACGT and so on. And DNA is usually, it's, it's a double-stranded thing. And, and when, when cells divide, they replicate their DNA by the two strands zipping apart and, and, then, um, and then, uh, the, 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 then, then becoming double-stranded again by just picking up, um, picking up atoms that, that they can sort of fill their complementary pieces with. But the basic point is, the DNA molecule is this long string where it has some sequence of ACGT and so on. And the way the chemistry works out, and this is kind of a cleverness of biology, is you can have any sequence of ACGT and so on. It doesn't, any sequence will work. The, it's not the case that the molecule will only hang together if there's a particular sequence, any sequence will work. So then the question is, well, what sequence do you get? And normally that's determined just by uh, genetics of, um, you know, you start from your, um, the, um, uh, um, uh, you, you start from um, uh, the, um, uh, uh, you know, your, your, your parents' DNA, and then you get a copy of that DNA, and so on. Um, and uh, you, yeah, you, you can tell that I'm more of a, a computational person than a person who has been in labs making things in biology. And someone just put uh, on here the list. Okay, so it's adenosine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. And I guess I, I have very much heard of all of those. I, I'm, uh, and now I should commit that to memory. So the next time this comes up, I'm, I'm, not, um, um, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna say just ACGT. Um, anyway, the, um, so, uh, that's DNA can be this arbitrary sequence. Now the question is, if you want to go and edit that DNA, to what extent can you just sort of arbitrarily determine, I want my DNA to have, uh, to, I want to replace this sequence in the DNA with some other sequence. Well, how would you do that? Well, 
what happened is that in the last, I don't know, when was it? 10 years ago, 15 years ago, rather recently, a whole chain of different little discoveries were made about bacteriophages, viruses and infect bacteria, and this little mechanism and that little mechanism. And eventually there was this uh, sort of collection of mechanisms that got called CRISPR-Cas9 that are basically a way of saying, um, here's, here's a new sequence that I want to insert at this position in DNA, go insert it. And there had been um, uh, the, the question of, of uh, how do you normally get sort of different DNA sequences? Well, you can, you can create a sequence sort of step by step with a, with a machine that just actually sort of uh, knits together a DNA strand, you know, base pair by base pair. Um, you can do things where you take uh, sort of um, sequences that exist from other organisms and you kind of graft them into things and so on. But the idea of just being able to, you specify a sequence, you specify where it should go, and then it inserts itself. That's kind of the, the, the thing of gene editing and, and the CRISPR idea. So how does it figure out where to insert itself? The answer is, the, what it does is it says, what are the flanking sequences? What are the, 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 the sequences on your DNA? And because of the combinatorics of DNA, you don't need a very long sequence to know that, that for it to be the case that that's the only place it occurs. So for example, for human DNA, I don't know what it is, let's see, six base pairs, seven base pairs, something like that. That's not always enough. There are some sequences that repeat a lot and those always cause trouble for, for, um, uh, for gene sequencing and so on because of the way that works. But, but usually by the time you have a decently long sequence, I don't know, 12, 15 base pairs, that kind of thing, the chance that will only occur at most once on the human genome. So if you have a, some process where it says only do something at a place where, um, uh, where there are these particular flanking sequences, the thing will just sort of float around and eventually it will find that place on the DNA where the flanking sequences match. And let's say, okay, let me go and snip the DNA, reinsert this new sequence there, and now you've changed your DNA. So that's a big deal because if you, for example, let's say that you have a particular uh, version of a particular gene that is liable to give you cancer or that, or that uh, produces some uh, uh, some, uh, some enzyme or something that is very bad for you or that has some other or that isn't able to produce something that you need for some kind of cell, you can say, well, let's just go in and edit it. And, and that's kind of the idea. And there's been a small number of, of, of trials of, uh, of therapies that are based on that. I'm sure there'll be a lot more in time to come. As is always the case with medicine, all sorts of crazy things go wrong. You, you know, you, you try and do something for that relates to, I don't know, uh, degeneration of the retina of the eye, and you're, you know, injecting some, uh, something that contains this, you know, CRISPR-Cas9 thing, and then, then that makes a change that wasn't the one you expected, and it has a side effect here because the flanking sequence uh, was, was uh, uh, bound to some other part of the DNA, and it's always, there's always some complexity to, to what happens. Um, and, um, the uh, the thing that um, uh, so so you know that, that's that's one story of CRISPR. Now there are some other things that um, uh, like one of the uh, uh, you know you can you can potentially one one feature of, of of actually editing the DNA of an organism is then it will pass it on to all of its progeny. So by the time your DNA is edited, if you edited if if the DNA of a of a of a cell that um, uh, is, is going to keep replicating and so on, is edited in you, then all the things that come from that cell are also edited. So people have all kinds of schemes of, of changing the mosquito population by having, um, uh, by sort of driving uh, a change in their genetics into, into that population and so on. And, and there are all kinds of terrible things that could go wrong type situations. Um, but the, the, um, uh, that's, that's kind of the, 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 the basic idea. Of, um, of gene editing and, and sort of the notion is, can you make a sort of computer aided design system where you just basically say, hey, I wanna change my DNA in this way and you can go and just start changing it. The actual design process is not quite so simple because there are all kinds of design constraints on where exactly you can do this insertion and, and there's gradual 
development of the sort of technology of exactly what are the, um, you know, what are the sort of supports you need and the, it's a little bit like the 3D printing thing of what exactly you need to have to be able to insert that, that uh, sequence and so on. Um, but that, that's the basic idea. Um, let's see. Uh, the question here from Aaron, why are routines for sleeping, eating, exercise so helpful for mammals? When is routine harmful? You know, one of the things that I don't think we understand terribly well is that our bodies have a definite rhythm to them. Uh, part of it is the circadian rhythm the rhythm that is uh, connected to the, uh, the, the daily rhythm. You know, we are, we are set up to uh, sort of be this way at this time of day and that way at that time of day, to fall sleepy at this time of day, be really energetic at that time of day, uh, you know, produce, secrete this hormone at that time of day, those kinds of things. And part of that is mediated in our brain by the pituitary gland and things like that in the center of our brain, but it's, there's, there's good evidence that in every single cell of our body, there is some amount of circadian rhythm that develops. There are some, uh, some sequences of genes and gene activation that basically pick up this rhythm, this sort of 24 hour rhythm, and it gets synchronized presumably by things like light and by, you know, are you in sunlight, are you not in sunlight, those kinds of things. But it's something which once, once it's got that rhythm, it will tend to just keep going with that rhythm until it's sort of forcibly re, uh, re-synchronized. And you know, when you go to different time zones and you get jet lag and things like that, the story of that is that you're, you're sort of, uh, you're, uh, you're disrupting those circadian rhythms. And it can take weeks, even a month, even longer for the sort of circadian rhythm of all those different parts of your body effectively to adapt to this new different time zone. And you know, it was thought originally that it was just a feature of the brain, and um, but it, it seems not to be. It seems to be something that's sort of in all our different cells, and so it's really a a um, a thing where our, for whatever reason, um, it is sort of a a feature of uh, of biology that uh, biology likes to keep itself organized, I suppose, in that way, and to have organisms kind of do things at repeatable times. Now, now presumably that was of adaptive advantage back in the day when it's like, don't go out at night where you're, when your you know, night vision predator is going to eat you. Don't, um, you know, uh, don't uh, bake in the sun at midday. Um, you know, try to collect your food in the morning or something before it gets too hot in the desert or whatever else. And so it probably was useful to have a calendar, so to speak, for, for organisms. And that's um, no doubt in sort of the evolutionary way of explaining things, that's kind of um, how that type of thing developed. And I think the, um, generally uh, for, for us humans, uh, people do better when they have a definite schedule. And it's always quite disruptive when people have to kind of jump around to different schedules. People, people sometimes, uh, the, the, eventually the schedule tends to be synchronized to things like the sun. Most people have a natural schedule that isn't quite 24 hours, for example, and, and people will have, you know, experiments, well, but people have done where you're, you know, in a cave without any outside light and you don't know what time it is and you don't have a watch and, and so on. And it must be difficult to do those experiments now with computers where there's just an awful lot of places to get the time, so to speak. But anyway, in any case, the, um, uh, but people tend to have, um, a little bit less than, I think it's more common to have a less than 24 hour schedule than a more than 24 hour schedule. And people who are like in, uh, you know, hard working on this or that thing have a habit of, of letting their schedules, you know, some people in, uh, who are, um, will sort of let their schedules drift and they'll, they'll sometimes drift by, by, you know, being, oh, it's 24 hours and 30 minutes each day between when they, when they, the successive times they get up, so their schedules will kind of uh, gradually shift around the day. But um, I, I think it's, um, uh, you know, the thing that's surprising about circadian rhythms is that so many things get entrained in it, not only when you feel sleepy, but also what is your body temperature? Uh, you know, when do you feel hungry? What um, uh, other kinds of secretion from, from glands that, um, you know, happen at different times of day and so on? 
I mean, it's just like, like biology has this habit. Once you've got some particular train you're going on, just pile all these things under that train. Like you've got the sleep wakefulness cycle. Okay, let's throw all these things into what happens when you're asleep. Let's throw all these things into these particular times when you, you know, wake up or whatever else. So I think that's, um, uh, that's, that's the kind of way that that works. Um, there's a question here from Mikhail. Is there an example where self-assembly is industrially used? So at the level of molecules, self-assembly is used quite a lot. I mean, you know, your average virus uses it to assemble the capsid of the virus. It's pieces of protein or, or some molecules like insulin, I think, is a, is a molecule that comes originally in, in five different pieces and they, they assemble themselves. So at the molecular scale, there are definitely examples, well, they're really biological examples uh, where self-assembly is used. Um, in terms of uh, assembling things, things which assemble themselves. I mean, I am, mm, I'm having a hard, hard time thinking of that. I mean, I, I could imagine a case where you have a mechanical object, which can only be fit together in a certain way. And you just sort of jiggle things around and eventually it fits together. And that's sort of a version of self-assembly, but I don't think, I mean, usually there has to be some process that's doing the assembling, even if it's just jiggling things around. And I'm not sure I can't immediately think of, let me see. Um, no, I mean, there are plenty of things that are sort of chemical, which you can think of as self-assembly. Like you put two chemicals together and they have a reaction where these two molecules were put together in a certain way. And you can think of that as a sort of self-assembly process. Um, I think at a slightly larger scale, you can imagine, I don't know, you're making some kind of concrete and it has particles of different sizes and you kind of smoosh the things together and they end up getting, um, uh, and, and they end up, the, the, the small particles go between the big particles in a certain fashion. And that's kind of a self-assembly type of thing. But in terms of, in terms of something as impressive as some of the molecular self-assembly, where things sort of fit together in this nice icosahedral shape or something because the molecules just fit in the right way, I'm, I'm not immediately coming up with an example of that. Um, let's see, there's a question also from Mikhail, how harmful are plane flights in terms of radiation exposure? Um, so what, what, you know, where does radiation come from? Uh, in, there's a bunch of radiation. So radiation is the result of atomic nuclei self-destructing and producing uh, particles that are going fast. Maybe they're electrons, maybe they're photons, maybe they're alpha particles, which are like helium nuclei. Um, and there are a variety of ways that that radiation can be produced. One of them that's pretty common is radon, which is a, 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 um, a gas that's radioactive that uh, can seep up from the ground in different places. And people in different parts of the world and different uh, kind of settings, people are always concerned about that. And, and when you build buildings, it's like you know doing radon ins inspections and things. So one source of radioactivity can be uh, from from radioactivity in in the ground. Um, that's that's one source. Another source of radioactivity is from cosmic rays, um, from uh, uh, radiation that comes from mostly from the sun. Um, uh, although there are uh, cosmic rays that come long distances away from, from uh, uh, energetic stars and other processes, even outside our galaxy. But um, uh, the most, most cosmic rays are coming from the sun. Um, and uh, that uh, there's sort of a stream of particles, just as the sun produces light, it also produces streams of charged particles, like mostly protons and so on. Um, and those uh, hit the atmosphere of the earth and they, um, uh, they, go a certain distance. By sea level, mostly gone. The only thing most of the primary protons from the cosmic rays that hit the, uh, the top atmosphere of the Earth, they're all, they're all dissipated by the, what they've, they've crashed into other protons. They've, they've made a cascade of particles. There are some muons, the neutrinos, which just go right through the Earth, actually. But, but there are muons that survive at the Earth's surface. And there's probably a muon goes through us at sea level maybe once every couple of minutes. Um, just one muon doesn't really do any harm. Uh, if you go to higher altitudes, there's less atmosphere for the protons to have interacted in. And so there are more primary cosmic ray protons. And even if you go to you know, Denver, which is a mile high, um, there will be a significantly more, I would guess five times more, I'm not sure. Maybe more than that, I could work it out. Um, let's see, I vaguely remember 
Oh, let's see, we can calculate it. It's um, blah, 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 blah. The, the atmosphere is the equivalent of 33 feet of water, right? Is, is the pressure um, and or, or 760 millimeters of mercury. Um, those are the atmospheric pressure, and that tells us something about the amount of material in sort of a column above us in the atmosphere. And then you can work out, boy, this is a, this is a bit of a complicated calculation. The, the, uh, uh, the protons to interact, the, the interaction cross-section at um, small energies is about 40 millibonds. Um, and uh, well, I, I don't know whether I can do this in my head. Um, could with a little bit more effort, um, can probably work out what the what the amount of I mean there will be there, there'll be gradually more and more primary cosmic ray protons. So by the time you're at forty thousand feet, which is the altitude that commercial planes tend to fly at, or 36, 40,000 feet, whatever, um, there is significantly more cosmic radiation. Um, how much of it gets? Uh, I think some of it is absorbed in the aluminum skin of the plane, but but plenty of it is still still going, so to speak. Is it a significant effect? No, it's not a very significant effect. Um, is it something that is the equivalent of, I think, you know, when you when you get an X-ray for your teeth or or some other thing, you get a certain amount of radiation. It's the amount of radiation has been going down because X-ray, digital X-ray sensors are much more sensitive than X-ray film and so on tended to be, and so you need many fewer uh, many fewer X-rays and, and and lower energy X-rays. To get the same kind of images, um, but I think that the uh, you know flying around the world all the time at forty thousand feet is the equivalent of a modest number of of, uh, of teeth X rays and things. So it's a it's a kind of a small effect. Um, and uh, uh, but you know by the time you're in space um, with no sort of uh, protection from the atmosphere, cosmic rays are more of a big deal. And when you get outside the Van Allen belts. Um, which are the, um, uh, well, actually, okay, there's a different effect there, which has to do with, um, uh, those are mostly electrons that I think that come from uh, solar flares. Um, and those are, uh, in when we're in the protection of the Earth's atmosphere, that's not such a big deal. When it's a question of um, uh, things in space, either satellites or humans, these solar flares, I think there's a famous one, the, what is it, the Carrington event or something, which was a, a very big flare that just spewed charged particles from the sun, which damaged all kinds of equipment um, and, and can have an effect on the, on the Earth's surface, but, but it's, it's less than, much less than in space. And those things for, if you're an astronaut in space, that's a, that's a much more significant effect. But I think it's not. Uh, by the way, on, on the surface of the Earth, you know, you live at a higher altitude, you get more radiation. You live near the poles, the, um, uh, particularly the electrons from the sun tend to spiral in near the magnetic poles of the earth. And they're the things that lead to, for example, the aurora borealis and things like that, uh, the auroras. Those are the results of electrons um, hitting uh, molecules of things like oxygen in the upper atmosphere uh, of the earth and producing light when they when they hit the upper atmosphere but those are that's a sign that there's a whole bunch of electrons coming in um, that represent radiation um, so there's more radiation near the magnetic poles than there is in other parts of, of the earth but these are not significant effects and um, uh, I don't think there's there's no evidence of, of that I'm aware of of um, uh, of kind of um, sort of terrible effects from that. I mean, people are very interested in, in radiation effects from all kinds of things. Like one of the ones that's a, a, big, a big issue of, of some controversy is cell phones and um, uh, the radiation that comes from the uh, microwave antennas of cell phones. And there's a lot that's done to try and reduce the amount of microwave radiation, not the same thing as, as radiation of the of the of, of ionizing radiation, which comes from radioactivity. Microwave radiation is essentially just cooking you like it does in a microwave oven. It's not uh, it's not doing the things uh, when you have ionizing radiation. It actually will destroy molecules and things and destroy pieces of DNA and things like that. Um, it's a much more gradual process when you're just sort of cooking them with microwaves and so on. But there's a lot that's done with cell phones and so on to try and prevent it being the case that you get lots of radiation when you like hold the cell phone up to your ear and there's a whole elaborate 
scheme of, you know, when you put your hand around the cell phone, it can sense that and it reduces the power that it's transmitting and, and so on and so on and so on. Um, but there's sort of a, a continuing question of what biological effects can uh, cell phone radiation actually have. And for example, 5G uh, cell phones, which work in a different way and have much more local, uh, uh, local um, uh, transmission, is that different? I mean, my own guess without really knowing too much about it is that uh, 5G is a more, more directed kind of set, set up and there's less kind of intense broadcast radiation. And my guess would be it will be a, um, a better situation in terms of, of being cooked by it um, than, than earlier technologies, but I'm not sure about that. Um, but I think the, um, uh, the, this question is, what actually does it do? What does a, a, you know, a, a few gigahertz um, uh, a piece of radiation from a cell phone actually do to biological material? Um, and one doesn't really know. And you know, there's certainly concern that there are protein molecules that are just the right length to kind of be, uh, be sort of um, uh, be, be flapped around, so to speak, by, um, by those microwaves and so on. But, but it isn't really known. Um, and, and there are at best kind of, um, uh, there's sort of uh, lots of studies that have been done and lots of studies on different kinds of animals and lots of studies that show different kinds of effects. And I think it's all still, still quite muddy. Um, it's probably one of these cases where the, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult case where kind of um, socio-political issues intersect with scientific and medical issues, and it's kind of hard to know what's going on. Um, but, uh, that, that's, um, but that's not radiation in the sense of ionizing radiation, that's radiation in the sense of uh, just uh, microwaves of the kind that you find cooking food in a microwave oven and so on. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, there was a question here from Danielle, if I were able to create a black hole the size of a marble in my living room, would it destroy the cosmos or just make a hole in my couch? Okay, so a black hole the size of a marble. Let's see. Uh, well, one question is how massive is a black hole the size of a marble? I think that the sun, uh, something a bit bigger than the sun that turns into a black hole there's this thing called the Schwarzschild radius, which is the kind of the typical radius of the sort of outside, the event horizon of a black hole. And I'm trying to remember how big that is. It's on the order of kilometers, a kilometer or so, I think, for something of the mass of the sun. So I think uh, for something the size of a marble, you're talking about an object that has the gravitational attraction of... Um, uh, something pretty big, you know, a planet-sized thing, I suspect. Um, and so that means that you're kind of concentrating all the gravity from that really pretty big thing into that tiny object. And so, yes, the, the, you know, there'll be a, a gravitational attraction of everything to that object. Um, and, uh, the, um, and, and what will that do? Well, it's, it's kind of like just, um, it's, it's, it's just like, it's like a, it will be kind of a bit like a magnet, except that it's a magnet that just doesn't, doesn't just apply itself to materials that happen to be magnetic, but gravity has the feature that anything with mass is attracted by gravity. And so that means that any material, actually anything, anything with, uh, uh, in some sense, anything is attracted by gravity. Um, that's kind of the way that general relativity and the, uh, the structure of space time works. Um, that sort of anything, is but what one could think of is, is anything is distorted to kind of fall towards the this thing that is uh, the source of gravity, and so one could expect that unlike you know you if you had a room that was all magnetic and you had this very very strong magnet, um, again a magnet actually works in a slightly different way because a magnet always has a north and south pole, whereas gravity is just like everything is being pulled into one place. Um, it's uh, uh, so it will be kind of like everything is being attracted to this one place. And I'm, uh, you can be quite certain that any, any structure like um, um, 
Well, the question is, would the earth be sucked into a thing of the size of a marble? My guess is the answer to that is yes. Um, but I think it's a slightly more detailed question and how far, how far the effect, how far out the effect will be. And what will tend to happen is around a black hole, you'll eventually get things will start swirling around instead of just being some things that don't have any angular momentum will just be pulled straight into the black hole. But things that do have some kind of swirling motion will start being swirled around and they'll swirl around faster and faster. And typically as they approach the black hole, they'll be swirling so fast that they're emitting, they'll start emitting light, then they'll start emitting x-rays and so on, as they kind of are pulled faster and faster and faster in um, towards the, the black hole. And eventually they will go through the event horizon of the black hole and be lost forever, so to speak. Um, but yes, so I think, I think um, uh, kind of a bad, um, uh, not, um, not a safe thing to have in your, uh, you know, if you have a, a pocket black hole, um, you don't get to have a pocket or a planet, I suspect, for, for very long. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, as I say, I'm, I'm happy to talk about any kind of uh, science question. Hmm. Okay. It's a question from Zayden. Is it true that our electrical distribution networks and neuronal networks in the brain have the same configuration? I don't particularly think so. Um, I think that there are... Um, in the brain, well, okay. So the brain has, you know, a hundred billion neurons, each one connected to maybe a thousand other neurons, and they're, you know, millimeters long and things like that. They have little wires effectively going out from them that produce this very complicated uh, electrical connection network. Um, the the purpose of that electrical connection network, in some sense, is to have us be able to think. And so it's kind of like things, you know, one neuron is activating other neurons, it's activating other neurons, and in the end we say hello or whatever. Um, the electrical, uh, but, but these neurons are, are sometimes organized into, I think there are cortical columns that are a whole sort of uh, organized structures of neurons and so on. And they're sort of modular pieces of the brain. I don't think it's super well understood what the, you know, how those modular pieces, what the significance of that is and, and all those kinds of things. Um, when it comes to the electrical distribution system, uh, I'm, uh, you tend to have setups where, um, well, okay, th there is one place that it is a bit similar. So um, when you are sort of sending electricity a long distance, you end up wanting to have it be at very high voltage, and you put it in wires that are kind of long distance wires. And that's different from what you get when you just plug your computer into an outlet or something. Um, the, that's 240 volts, whereas the, the, um, the wires that are used to, to transmit electricity over large distances, they're 20,000 volts usually, or, or more than that. Um, and there's sort of a different way of setting things up so that you're kind of optimized for long distance transmission. And it's a little bit the same for us because the nerves that are the nerve cells that are in our brain, they're just sort of sending signals, you know, electrical signals, one nerve cell to the next. But in the end, we want to activate our muscles, you know, in the finger fingers or something. And that requires that we send an electrical signal from our brain all the way down our arms to our fingers. And so they're actually different kinds of nerves. The, the nerves in our brain don't have myelin sheaths. The nerves that go long distances have myelin sheaths. And they're basically associated with trying to keep the signal, kind of keep the electrical signal kind of going for fur further. And that's a little bit analogous, not, not exactly the same physics, but a little bit analogous to what's done in, um, uh, in the case of electrical transmission systems, where you're kind of having something different about what's going to be transmitted over a long distance than the, the very local stuff. That's the, the closest I would know to, to, um, uh, to how that might work. Um, Question here from Mikhail about life on Europa, moon of Jupiter. Um, I am not super familiar with them. Um, uh, I'm afraid these, these different moons of Jupiter are not all my personal friends, you know, 
uh, Enceladus, the moon of Saturn. There's another one people talk about Io. I think people sometimes talk about. I mean, Europa is a is a moon that I think has kind of oceans um, that are under its outer surface because things are pretty cold out at Jupiter most of the time. Um, the uh, uh, mostly the light of the sun is, you know, the sun is a pretty small point of light in the sky by the time you get out to Jupiter. But there are still things that can heat things up. Like for example, the force of gravity on the tidal forces, um, they're essentially the tides, the, uh, even in the earth, there are solid tides that are raised on the earth. There are tides in the ocean where you're pulling water sort of closer, that's closer to the moon gets pulled up higher and further away from the moon gets sort of uh, goes, goes further away. That's a tidal deformation of the Earth associated with the gravity of the Moon. In addition to the water on the Earth, which is sort of an easy, uh, soft target in some sense for being pulled by the gravity, by, by gravity like that, uh, the, there is also a solid tide in the Earth where the rock of the Earth is slightly deformed by the Moon. So there are similarly solid tides in these other bodies um, uh, around Jupiter and so on. And I think that there is a certain amount of heating that happens as a result of the, those solid tides kind of squashing and unsquashing parts of these, um, uh, these, these moons and so on. And I think the uh, people talk about um, the fact that things are not so inhospitable in the ocean that's uh, kind of underneath the, the outer surface of, um, of Europa, at least that's, that's my recollection of it. And, and certainly there are, there are some very fun project ideas about spacecraft that would kind of uh, drill through the outer ice or something and go and, and uh, sort of hang themselves down into that ocean and see whether there are any critters uh, swimming around in there. Um, but I'm not, I'm not an expert in, in all of the details of that. Um, I think the, the whole question of, you know, where is their life, uh, you know, depends on what you mean by life. If you mean very Earth-like life, well, on Earth, life does pretty well in many situations. You know, it succeeds in being in hydrothermal vents that are pretty hot and pretty full of sulfur and so on in the oceans. It succeeds in going a certain distance to in Antarctica, although it doesn't really quite make it in the coldest places in Antarctica. It goes a certain distance down in the rock of the earth, but doesn't go that far down. You know, if you drill down a mile in, in, under the earth, you won't find any life there. If you go into the atmosphere, you know, well, birds fly at a certain height and so on. But when you get up to the very upper atmosphere, there isn't any life there either. So, you know, there's a certain zone in which life seems to thrive, at least life based on DNA and proteins and things like that. And so when we look for life that's like that elsewhere in the solar system, we have to find environments that are within the range of, of temperature, particularly that and pressure, actually. That, um, that can sustain the same kinds of molecules and so on. And so there are a limited number of places in the solar system where that works. You know, on Venus, for example, there are kind of maybe in the high clouds of Venus, the surface is too hot, um, but maybe in the clouds, there can be sort of things flapping around there that um, or, or floating around there. Um, they would have plenty of, um, you know, think it's plenty, quite easy for small things to be sort of suspended in the upper, upper atmosphere there, I think. And there are other particular places in the solar system where it's sort of roughly within the bounds of uh, kind of the, the, the temperature and pressure and so on that um, the molecules that make up life on Earth can thrive in. Um, let's see. Uh, well, there are a lot of more technical questions here, but I think this is probably not the place for those. Um, it's a question here about how do batteries wear out? Uh, it's a slightly, I, I know a little bit about that. Um, one of the funny things that happens in batteries is that you form these dendrites where, where you've basically formed sort of dendrites are like what you get in snowflakes. They're kind of a form of crystallization where you're just getting all this, all this sort of tree-like fluffy stuff formed. And that's something that happens in batteries. And I think gradually you're effectively shorting out the battery as you form these, these little tendrils inside it, I think. Um, that's, um, and I think when you see that kind of white fuzzy stuff, that's, that's kind of what's happened there. Um, but I'm not, I'm not completely sure about that. Um, all right, well, we should probably uh, uh, soon wrap up for today here, but... Um, let me see if there's maybe one other thing. Um, 
a comment from uh, William about 3D printing in space um, that uh, making the comment that I was saying on, on Earth, it's very important to have supports. It's like, how do you build the thing up? And um, how do you uh, make uh, sort of things go? Um, uh, you know, what do you do? You can't have a thing that's just floating in the middle of, uh, in, in the air, so to speak. It has to be supported. Uh, otherwise it just falls under gravity. And so William was commenting, well, would 3D printing be easier in space? Um, that's an interesting comment. And, and um, uh, the trouble with things in space and microgravity, you know, in, in, if you're in the space station or something, uh, the whole point is it's like, a, it's like if you're in an elevator and everything fails, really can't happen in, in modern elevators, but, and the elevator just drops under gravity and it's just falling, then uh, I suppose there probably rides at uh, amusement parks that do this where you're just falling. Well, then everything is weightless in the sense that there is, there is no, it's not like if you hold out your hand and there's a thing above your hand, um, it won't fall towards your hand because your hand and it are falling at exactly the same rate. And so it, it appears to be weightless to you because you're in kind of a reference frame in which that you, everything is falling, so to speak. And uh, you know people do that with planes. Um, there is a, a parabolic trajectory. That's the trajectory. That's the same trajectory. If you if you threw something and it fell under gravity and it was still going forward a bit, it would it would trace out a parabola more or less up to air resistance issues. Um, and planes, if they fly on a parabolic trajectory, the people inside them can uh, feel weightless for a little while until the plane has to pull up and not crash into the ground. Um, and uh, so that's, you know, you can, you can kind of simulate small amounts of weightlessness. Okay, what happens in, in space? Well, in, in, if you're on the space station, the space station in orbit is sort of continually falling towards the earth, except that it doesn't, doesn't crash into the earth because by the time it's fallen that far, it's over the side of the earth and it's just gonna make an orbit around the earth. Um, and so things are weightless. Usually it's said to be microgravity because there are small perturbations in the in the, the shape of the Earth is not precisely spherical, and there are other effects that cause there to be, uh, and there are even the effect of gravity of the actual pieces of the space station have mass and produce some gravity, but it's you know it's very small gravity, so things are more or less weightless, and so then the question is well what happens? So let's imagine you had a, a one of the things that's confusing is if you pick something up and you are sort of floating in the space station, you throw something. Well, momentum conservation says, if you throw something in this direction and it has some momentum in that direction, momentum has to be conserved. So there has to be some momentum going in the opposite direction. It's Newton's third law. To every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And so you throw the thing that way and you recoil back. And if you're a lot heavier than the thing you threw, well, momentum is a mass times velocity. So you have less velocity than the thing you threw if your mass is larger, but still you'll recoil a certain amount. And, and so that's the sort of confusing thing about a lot of stuff that happens in microgravity is that sort of uh, things, just, things just keep moving. So for example, I would suspect that when you extrude plastic from a, um, uh, that, that whereas in um, your kind of, uh, you're squirting it out, and on in, in gravity on Earth, the the little stream that you're squirting out will sort of fall down. It'll it'll make a kind of pool, and then it'll solidify. But in space, the thing you're squirting out won't fall anywhere. It'll just keep squirting out, and and so I suspect there are a bunch of really complicated issues about dealing with uh, make, doing 3D printing in space. And I, and I have heard of 3D printing being done in space. I'm not sure exactly how it all worked. But for example, when you have uh, a water, uh, some water, you, um, you know, on Earth, you can make a water drop, but the water drop will be, you know, will be deformed by gravity and will fall and it will just go splat. But in space, you can make a big blob of water. And in fact, one of the issues in space stations and so on is that, you know, gradually people spill water and things like that. And what happens to water? It doesn't just go in a drain and fall down. It just makes a big blob somewhere. And so I think this was a problem, particularly with the MERS space station back in the day, that there were just big blobs of water everywhere. 
And what do, you, what do you do? You have to sort of vacuum up these big blobs of water and it's kind of rather, rather icky to do the whole thing. But, um, you know, so, so you have a big, uh, in microgravity, you can have a big blob of water and you can do things like you can blow on one side of it and the water will, will move around because the water tends to, tends to make a sphere because of surface tension. So it, it will tend to be the case that the, the layer of atoms right on the surface uh, will be that the atoms in the interior will be pulling the atoms on the surface. And so what will tend to happen is that the thing will have the minimum surface area because the atoms in the interior are pulling on the atoms on the surface and there's nothing to pull outwards on the atoms on the surface. And so the thing will form into the, the shape that has the minimum surface area, which uh, if there are no other constraints is a sphere. But then you can like blow on one side of the sphere and it'll kind of wobble around and maybe the thing will start rotating. And if you start it rotating, it will eventually, as, as you rotate it, it will get elongated, um, just as the Earth gets elongated, actually, although it's a solid object and you know, the elongation is quite small at the equator, but, but uh, a, a drop of, of water in space will get elongated quite easily as you, as you kind of spin it around. And actually, one thing I was curious about for a long time is what happens to a splash in space? So uh, when you kind of, drop water on, um, on a solid surface, or you drop water into water, they look a bit different. What happens is the, you can get, it's one of the early applications for flash photography, was taking these pictures of uh, kind of at the moment of impact, what does it actually look like? And what it looks like is there's this kind of crown shape that forms, the corona it's called. And the, 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 the drop comes in, and then there's this kind of uh, sheath of water that goes out, and then as the sheath of water, as this kind of cylinder of water goes out, it breaks up into a bunch of spikes that look like kind of the, the, um, the spikes of a crown. And, and that's the typical form of a splash. And then it, it forms into that. And then the wall of water crashes and it just falls down under gravity. Right in the center, there will be, for example, if you drop a drop of water into water, there will actually be uh, the drop drops in and there'll actually be a sort of rebound drop where the thing forms a kind of stem. And then there'll be a little drop at the top of that stem. And it's like you drop the water in and right where it fell in, there will be this kind of this tower that develops, which eventually will end up with a drop at the end. So there are these two effects. There's this one sort of corona that forms from the outer part of the splash and this thing in the center. What happens in the outer part of the splash is this. If, if you have a, a sheet of water, it's unstable because of surface tension. Because this, what happens is you have the sheet of water and it will tend to be the case that if the sheet has one little tiny imperfection in it, it will tear apart because the water really wants to be clumped together more. It doesn't want to be spread out in the sheet. The surface tension will tend to clump it together that way. And so that's a, a type of instability that happens in kind of sheets of water and so on. Um, and um, so that's what's going on in a splash. So the question is, what happens in a splash in space? And so is years ago now, I. I knew some astronauts and I said, can't you just try this? And they said, we really don't want to try this because if you make a splash, you know, if you take some water and you go, you know, you hit it against some surface or whatever, it'll shatter. And all the little pieces of water, all the water drops will go all over the place. And we'll be cleaning up water drops for, for months afterwards, so to speak. So not a good experiment to try. But so I, I still don't really know what happens with splashes in space. I think, I think somebody did actually eventually try something like that. And I, I mean, my guess about what would happen, well, I'm actually not sure. I think the instability, the surface tension instability will be there, but whether you would see kind of uh, sort of rivers of, of whether what you would see is something which is more like a, um, uh, you know, the, the water drop hits something and more like uh, kind of this, this tube of, of water comes back reflected. So it's as if it might be, um, you know, a, a billiard ball hitting something and the whole billiard ball is reflected. Um, I, I kind of have the suspicion that it's more like a tube of water that gets reflected back, but I don't know for sure. Um, but uh, um, it's, um, um, it's a, uh, uh, yeah, it's a, maybe somebody has tried that experiment by now. Um, uh, Asa comments that, um, isn't it weird that our body mo mostly works fine in zero gravity? Yeah, it is kind of weird. It is kind of weird. I mean, a lot of aspects of the way we work are based on uh, kind of, you know, there are a lot of things that kind of um, are, one would think were things sort of falling and pooling. But I think the basic point is that 
you know, there's our blood pressure, for example, is comparatively high. It is not, you know, there's actually a pressure that our heart is putting to pump blood through our system. And that's sufficiently high that it sort of overcomes the basic force of gravity. And I suppose in, I don't really know whether in sort of, it was an evolutionary thing to, oh, you can eat when you're hanging upside down in a tree type thing. And that will probably force certain things to work even when the gravity is the wrong way around. But yeah, one would think, and, and I know it happens, that there's a certain amount of pooling of fluids and things like that that happens in space. And there's plenty of things like, uh, you know, bone mass, muscle mass, things like that. There's, you know, it's when we get exercise on Earth, we are resisting the force of a lot of what we end up doing, just walking around and so on. We are expending energy to resist the force of gravity and we're putting, uh, we're putting pressure on bones and things like that. And we're, we're sort of reminding the bone, you should be growing here. I mean, it's, it's the way that, um, uh, you know, bones, I think in, um, uh, you know, for kids and so on, there are growth plates at the end of long bones, like in the, in the legs and so on, where there are, you know, the, the bones just grow at those growth plates. And depending on sort of how much force is on that, they'll grow differently. And, that, and that's why, for example, there are complicated things. If, the, if, your, if your gait is sort of off and you are putting more pressure on one side than the other, then that will have sort of, so that can have nasty feedback effects as that one grows more than the other one grows and, and so on. But yeah, it is, it is an interesting fact that our bodies more or less work in zero gravity. You know, the question is um, sort of, will they work for the trip to Mars? Will they work, you know, what will it be like if you hang out on Mars for, uh, you know, for, for 10 years? I mean, people used to think when, when, when cars were just being invented, people said, you know, the human body is not gonna survive traveling at more than 20 miles an hour or some such other thing. Now, of course, as is so often the case, that sounds like a kind of stupid statement, but um, I think really roads were pretty bad because they were really intended for horses to, you know, to walk along and, and big cartwheels and things to, to go along. And, you know, people would imagine, oh gosh, if you are going over those, those, um, uh, those bumps at 50 miles an hour, you know, you would just get to vibrated to pieces. Um, but of course, then, uh, you know, roads got to be made smoother and things like that. And so the bumps disappeared, but not because of something, you know, because of a, a difference in, in the way the thing was set up. I mean, it, of course, we humans have all kinds of nasty resonances because it's like, uh, you know, if you, if you uh, different frequencies, different parts of our insides will start wobbling back and forth and uh, can cause all, all kinds of trouble. But that doesn't tend to be a thing that, um, uh, that happens because we're not typically exposed to those frequencies. Um, and uh, 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 so, so not, not so much of an issue. All right, well, I see some more questions here which would be fun to answer at a different time. And um, uh, I'm, um, uh, I think we should wrap up for now here. So uh, thanks for joining us and see you again another week.